Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, looking at some issues around how we build an effective learning and development strategies for the 21st century organization. I've called it uh, learning and technology tying the knot uh, in that I think it is a marriage uh, that we need to think about. And those of us who are married, we all know that uh, in marriage, uh, you also have to think about how you, these two people live together. And uh, yes, that is a photograph of uh, me and my wife on our wedding day uh, uh, on a beach in, in Australia. Uh, things change, I guess. <laughs> okay. uh, I think initially what I've got to say very much uh, reflects on what Tony Bazan talked about earlier on today. Uh, and that is that we're moving really into... Uh, a new age and a, uh, a world where we need to do things very differently. And the first question I'd pose is, are we still trying to perfect the irrelevant? And by that I mean, are we using approaches? Are we using the tools, the methodologies, the systems that really go back 2,000 and 2,500 years, I guess, to Plato and the Academy? Uh, of someone standing on their hind legs and uh, talking at, uh, at a group of people sitting down, exactly as we are now, uh, whereas the world has changed. And, and uh, I think that uh, Peter Senge, uh, many of us all will know a bit about his work and his work in the learning organization, posed this question about, uh, or this statement, that if you look at, uh, uh, ask the question how the world of the child has changed in the last 150 years, and the answer is it's hard to, to pinpoint areas where it hasn't changed. Yet, when you look at the world or at the schools today, it's, uh, there are a lot of similarities and very few differences. And in fact, I think in adult organizational learning, it goes exactly the same, and in fact, with, with bells and whistles on it. In lots of ways, what is being done in formal uh, learning and training uh, within organizational learning and training today is very similar to what was done 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, in many, in many ways. Uh, yet, at the same time, many of our employees are actually being shaped by this whole new world. Uh, there, if you, again, if you look at Mark Prensky's work in terms of the experiences that young people have today, they have totally different experiences uh, to the experiences that people my age, my generation had. They're actually uh, shaped and are shaping social and interactive uh, media tools. And these are the, the logos and the, the signs of, of all these tools. I'm sure that uh, uh, most of us will, will uh, use them, be aware of them. Anyway, so I think that there are some very important questions to ask uh, L&D professionals. And uh, putting it in the words of uh, someone of my of my generation, Bob Dylan, uh, I think there's something is happening here and a lot of people don't actually know what it is. Uh, the world's changing and how do we respond and build our, uh, our L&D environments and our learning strategies to meet this, this changing world? Uh, just drawing on one other uh, person who I think really does understand a lot about organizations and how organizations work, uh, and in fact, it's the, uh, the centenary of uh, Peter Drucker's birth this year, 2009. Uh, and, and Drucker wrote in the, uh, in the Training and Development uh, magazine, the, the Journal of the American Society of Training and Development, uh, way back in 2000, that he felt that, that trainers need to realize that there are things that are going on that don't fit their assumptions, their own training backgrounds, and the way they've been doing their jobs. And, and I would argue that in the period between 2000 and 2009, some things have changed, uh, but in, in lots of ways, uh, not a lot have changed. So stepping back to our raw, our raw material, in other words, we as learning and development professionals, what, are we, what sort of world are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with a, a world, as I say, which is changing dramatically. Uh, the whole concept of a flat world, uh, is, is emerged, the fact that globalization, uh, despite all the uh, economic vagaries that are, 
are taking place at the moment, uh, there's no doubt that we're not going to revert from that. Uh, when we look at how we manage our people and how our people uh, work within an organization, there's actually uh, some real issues. Uh, first of all, in the global skill shortage. And again, it's sort of ironic in the, the current turmoil, but in fact, there is still uh, a, a, a war for talent, for really, really talented people and capable people. Uh, and, and equally, when we look at some of the research, there's a disconnect between how CEOs uh, rate the importance of, for example, talent management uh, and actually their performance and their involvement in this area. Uh, and I'll come back to, to talking a little bit about the absolutely vital need to engage managers and senior managers in both building strategies and executing learning and development strategies. Without managers, actually they're the most important people. Without them, uh, we can't do, do anything. On the other hand, we look at uh, the social media I was talking about uh, and this new generation of workforce. We've got uh, an entry into the use of social media, media by not just the Gen Ys, the, 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 the Net Geners, but also by the, ba by the baby boomers and the, the Gen Xs and so on. Uh, and we've got this proliferation of devices and uh, uh, channels in which we all use to a lesser or greater, ex greater extent. Uh, and we as learning and development professionals need to think about how we build and help support people in terms of using those tools and environments. So really, uh, I think the key challenge is how do we build our learning and development strategies to meet this new workforce? Uh, and moving from what I've called the 20th century General Motors production model into a Google search and find model. And I really would reflect uh, what Tony Bazan was saying, which is it's not about learning stuff. It's about having the tools to be able to find stuff. It's moving from a world of, of knowledge acquisition to a, a world of having the tools and the resources to be able to find what you need when you need it uh, to be able to perform uh, to the level at which you need to perform. So in terms of, of building an L&D strategy, I think the first question you need to ask, or we, we, we need to ask is, how does our function add value uh, and strategic value to our organization? And I think that when we reflect on this and look at it, uh, there was some work done by uh, IBM some, some few years ago, uh, which determined that, in fact, the key strategic business needs that uh, the competition at the back there, uh, the key uh, strategic needs and business needs that we need to address are really around growth acceleration, transformation, and productivity increases. You talk to any senior leader in any organization, and they won't be focused on learning and development. They will be focused on how the business maintains and grows, transforms, and increases productivity. And our response to this needs to be by aligning with strategic business needs, by articulating the contribution that we make to the business in terms of a business value, and by making sure that our investment in learning is going to lead to productivity, to increased productivity. And so we're looking at how we, how we contribute to the business. And we have to think as business people. So in terms of developing strategies for the new world, uh, we have to think about building strategies which are moving us from this old world of push learning, formal, rigid, mandated, inflexible, instructor-led world into a world where we're providing the facilities for employees to pull what they need when they need it, to be able to find what they need when they need it, to facilitate collaboration and I certainly sit in the, in the camp of the constructivists in that our world is others, as Jerome Brunner has said, and that in fact we need others 
in order to live our lives, in order to work, in order to learn. We need to be able to provide personalized learning. We need to utilize user-generated content, flexible delivery, multiple channels, anything from wearable learning to whatever. And also, we need to utilize new media. So how do we go about this? Yep. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, learning through any sort of device such as I have in my pocket somewhere, uh, or here, uh, something like that, uh, that's mobile, something that I can access. I can utilize that, as I did on the train up this morning, talking to a chap sitting beside me on the train, and we were talking about something, and uh, in fact, we were talking, we were talking about uh, some work done by a woman called Linda, Professor Linda Grattan at London Business School. And this chap is starting a, interestingly enough, starting a new business in the current climate. And so uh, we hauled that out and Googled Linda and looked up various things. So I'm talking about utilizing diff what I call different channels. So how do we go about this? Well, the first thing we need to do is have a vision. We need to know where we want to go, what our aspirations are, and what our strategic intent is. So certainly, uh, having, uh, having been through this process a number of times, and most recently, uh, my own experience is that uh, uh, I've just left the employment of a company called Thomson Reuters. Uh, I work for Reuters, august English British organization set up in 1852, which was acquired uh, on the 17th of April last year by the Thomson Corporation of Canada. Uh, and my responsibility was to bring together the learning and development functions for those two organizations, uh, both information organizations, in fact, together the largest information organization in the world, uh, but very different in terms of culture and character. Uh, and my job was to, to bring together a new, define a new strategy, a new organizational model for learning and development, and make sure that the new organization was delivering or would deliver uh, what was required. And the first thing we did was we sat down and worked out what our vision would be. Uh, and from there, we then looked at some other elements. Now, underpinning all this, I think there are three key considerations when you develop a learning strategy. The first consideration is relevance and alignment. It's how do we ensure that what the learning and development function does is relevant to the business needs and aligned with those business needs. It's what I call working together, making sure that it's integrated with wider, wider organizational strategy. The second consideration, and I think is a real challenge uh, for many organizations, mine included, is capability. What I mean by that is, do we have within the L&D organization the capability to deliver a strategy that's suitable for the 21st century. And I call that delivering the goods. So just making sure that we have the right skills, the right experience, and particularly the right mindset in order to, uh, to do what's required to do. And, and lastly, there's the environment and the infrastructure. In other words, the tools. Do we have the right tools? to do the job. And of course, this conference is about learning technologies. I really absolutely believe that a learning and development strategy that isn't wrapped around with the right technology and wrapped around technology uh, actually is set up to fail. When we look at how, look at our other employees in the organization, you know, would, we expe would they expect to operate, do their daily job without technology? Of course not. Would you expect the learning and development bit of the organization to do its job without the right technology? Absolutely not. So the first, uh, the first key element in terms of uh, relevance and alignment working together, we've got to be business driven. What managers care about, as I said, is not necessarily about learning and development. Sometimes it's, it's absolutely wonderful when you meet uh, a manager who is really passionate about learning and development. Uh, I always see that as a bonus. What they really care about is how learning can contribute to growth, to productivity, 
the role learning and development can play in transformation, and this strategic value that the learning function can provide. What we did within, uh, within Thomson Reuters in, in addressing this initial issue is we spent some time identifying some principle, some basic principles of operation. What, we're going to, what was going to be our key operating principles in our new strategy? And the first one of those was that it would be business driven. It would also be agile, involved, scalable, have the right design development, innovative, involved on partnership model, metrics, and so on and so forth. But actually, the key one was that it would be business driven. And that, that is that we would align all L&D activities with global business priorities and deliver tangible business, uh, uh, business benefits. And in fact, the prioritization of what learning and development does sits firmly in the hand of business management. How we do it, what we need to do, sits firmly in the hands of the L&D professionals. But in terms of what needs to get done, what the priority is, uh, is absolutely the responsibility of business leaders. And therefore, if you don't have engaged business leaders uh, and informed business leaders, you won't get to first base in that. The second element I talked about was capability, delivering the goods. And that's a matter of having te technology-savvy L&D professionals. And I think that's a real challenge for us. Uh, again, certainly in my experience, uh, learning and development has often been seen as the graveyard of ambition. People move from some other part of the business, they, they get into learning and development, and they never go anywhere else. Uh, and in a way, uh, I think that uh, it doesn't really play to, to L&D's strength. And in fact, what we need within the L&D function, uh, not just technology savvy L&D professionals, but we need uh, L&D professionals who are performance consultants, who can understand the business needs, who can use consulting methodologies to understand where the performance gaps are, to understand what's holding the organization back, we need L&D professionals who can think beyond courses and curricula, uh, who can navigate through what I call the LMS paralysis. I've seen so many organizations that have spent millions of pound, dollar, yen uh, getting learning management systems in place and never move beyond that and feel that once they've got an LMS in place, that's great, we can track everything everyone does, job done, tick the box. Absolutely, you need these sorts of tools, but they're simply a means to an end. We also need L&D uh, professionals who are active participants in social networking. So they understand the power of social networking and understand what the tools can and can't do so that they can utilize them in the best possible way. Uh, wh again, what we did at, uh, uh, at Thomson Reuters is we took uh, some work that was done initially uh, through a collaborative uh, project, and I can see uh, someone from HSBC here who was uh, involved in that collaboration, Neil Wright here, uh, where we worked together and we looked at a uh, capability matrix and determined that actually what we needed in terms of L&D capability were people who could manage engagement, who could produce learning and development solution, that could identify uh, uh, and, and make sure that, that uh, performance effectiveness took place, that were effective at managing and planning, and particularly were au fait with learning innovation. And I've just circled a few of the, the key capabilities that we were looking for. So we wanted business consultancy. We wanted people who understood about learning communities. We wanted people who understood about change management and also uh, were able to evaluate emerging technologies. And very often in organizations, when you look through an L&D, the capabilities you have in L&D, you find some big gaps there. And in fact, one of the outputs of this was when we designed a new learning and development function within Thomson Reuters, we moved a huge amount of resource into uh, learning technologies and set up a team uh, of learning. To, uh, I don't think he's, Andy McGovern is not here, but the chap who is actually running the learning technologies, the whole learning technologies operation for Thomson Reuters globally, a guy called Andy McGovern is here, 
uh, at the conference. It's based in Geneva, but he's actually over, over for this. So we, we built a team that was focused on learning technologies and learning innovation. And that was a, a key part of the engine, of the L&D engine, to drive things going forward. Okay, yes, absolutely, Alan, I shall, I shall speak fast. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, the environment and infrastructure, deploying the tools. So we needed to use best, in, uh, best use technology, so we needed to focus on innovation, think richness reach. Those of you who may have read the Evans and Verster uh, business book written at the end of the 1990s called, Blow, called uh, Blown to Bits, which is about the telecoms revolution changing everything. We need to think about how we can provide richness and reach in terms of experiences. And also employ the Lego approach to technologies. In other words, do little bits that you can put together and take apart. And don't think that when you've just spent three years putting an LMS in place that that's the job done. In fact, there's a whole part of things that you're going to need to change and, and do things. So some underpinning principles, very quickly. First principle is that I think we need to accept that VUCA which is a term produced, uh, for, I first heard in way back 20, 30 years ago, the US military using it. That is, VUCA impacts everything we do. We're living in a world of increasing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that makes things pretty difficult. That workplace dynamics are changing. Uh, I won't spend time on this, but studies have shown that some 70 to 80% of what employees learn, they actually inquire, acquire informally on the job. In Thomson Reuters, we've embedded something called 70-20-10 across the organization. That is that 70% of what people learn, they learn on the job. 20% they learn through others, through coaching, through mentoring, through right networks, knowing the right people to ask. And 10% they learn formally. Thirdly, that real adult learning is more than classes. I'm sure all of us know that. I, I believe that learning is a product of a number of things. It's a product of experiences. It's a product of practice, of conversation, and reflection. It's not a product of transferring knowledge, whatever that is, from one head to another. Uh, it's, it's a little more complex than that. Fourthly, that L&D strategy must align with business strategy, which is what I started talking about, that it must contribute business value. It's got to be business-driven, scalable, innovative, effective and efficient, and cost-constrained. And lastly, I think one of the key principles, and certainly one of the key principles we worked on, was that knowledge retention was no longer a key differentiator for, for individuals or teams or organizations. But access to knowledge is the key differentiator, particularly working in a world where the knowledge which you have today may be incorrect a week, three weeks, a month down the line, and you have to go back. And if you're working on a model of knowledge acquisition, uh, you have to go back and relearn, unlearn, and so on. Whereas actually being able to find the right bit of knowledge, whether it's through knowing the right person about the right question or having access to information, is absolutely the key. And that it's necessary for us to learn a totally new way of thinking and performing and achieving. Thank you. Thank you very much,